Inflammation is a problem, whether it's happening from high levels of body fat, inflammatory foods, or super high circulating blood sugar. We still need to get down to the core of how we can modulate it. But what I want to address is what is worse when it comes to inflammation. Is having a high amount of body fat really worse for inflammation than high levels of blood sugar? Or is eating cakes all day and having your glucose super high, even if you're lean, worse when it comes down to inflammation? Well, there is a solid answer, so let's dive in. Today's video is sponsored by Element, L-M-N-T. I'm a fan of their citrus salt, it's super refreshing. They have their grapefruit salt, which is a delicious flavor. They have their watermelon salt, a bunch of different flavors. So that link gets you a free variety pack with any purchase. So when you purchase any kind of electrolytes from Element, you get a free variety pack when you use that link down below. And that has that perfect combination, it has 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 potassium, 60 magnesium, which is why I use it. It's the perfect ratio that I like specifically for me. That way I can use a full packet if I'm fasted, I'll use a half packet if I'm not fasted, and then drink the other half a little bit later on throughout the course of the day. So it's drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. Whether you are fasted or not, it's a super low or zero calorie way to get some flavor and to kind of kill your appetite as well. So check them out. That link is down below in the top line of the description. First, we look at a study that was published in the journal Lipids and Health and Disease. And this looks specifically at body fat and BMI. And it found a very clear correlation. And okay, the higher the BMI, the higher the body fat, the higher levels of C-reactive protein, and the higher levels of IL-6, interleukin-6. This sounds pretty vague, but it was a large scale amount of data, and it really does tell us a lot. But we can't just take that to the bank. We need to understand a bigger piece of the equation. So I have another study that takes a look at subcutaneous adipose tissue, like regular fat on our body, as well as visceral adipose tissue and how that impacts us. But before I jump into that study, let's look at how glucose affects inflammation. The primary way that high glucose drives up inflammation is actually indirectly. It drives it up by creating more oxidative stress. So what is called reactive oxygen species. And there was an interesting study that looked at this specifically in vitro and in vivo. Okay, what they found is they took fat cells, adipocytes, Okay, and they exposed them to high levels of glucose for short amounts of time and longer amounts of time by utilizing what's called a clamp, where they basically can expose cells to high glucose. They found that it triggered sort of a spontaneous release of more reactive oxygen species. So it drove up oxidative stress almost immediately in the fat cells. And this only increased more the longer the cells were exposed to glucose, demonstrating that if we have high levels of circulating glucose for long periods of time, it'll drive up this huge response in terms of oxidative stress. But what we now know is that this oxidative stress indirectly drives up interleukin-6. It drives up these inflammatory signals. So glucose indirectly is going to drive this up. Now where this becomes a problem is if it's chronically elevated. So I have some solutions here. We have to understand kind of the equation. One of the things that you can look at doing is implementing pomegranate or even like pomegranate extract uh, or even just concentrated pomegranate juice. And the reason is, is this seems to have a potent effect at reducing what are called advanced glycation end products. So advanced glycation end products are where glucose is circulating and then glucose will glycate go through glycation where it'll hit proteins or it can even hit certain lipids and actually caramelize them, okay? And that becomes an advanced glycation end product. Then these advanced glycation end products bind to what is called the receptor for advanced glycation end products, for it's called a RAGE. When it binds to that, it triggers an inflammatory response as well as oxidative stress. The more that glucose is circulating for a longer period of time, the longer that all these other tissues and cells are exposed to glucose and have an opportunity to go through glycation. This is a very serious problem, and it doesn't mean that you just go and eat a candy bar and that sugar is immediately becoming an advanced glycation end product. It is more about high circulating levels of glucose. This indirectly is a big inflammatory driver. So pomegranate is a very effective way. There's some interesting research behind that. Another thing you might wanna consider is increasing your monounsaturated fatty acid content. And the reason that I say that is there's some interesting evidence on MUFAs and how it can impact a cell to soak up glucose better. So essentially increasing insulin sensitivity. By increasing insulin sensitivity, you're making it so that the cell can receive a signal from insulin and soak up glucose faster. 
So what I mean by that is you eat something sweet and you want to have an insulin spike that is appropriately high to allow that cell to soak up the glucose so the glucose is not circulating, driving up inflammation. So what we're talking about here are really two different ways to combat the inflammation. We're talking about it by controlling glucose one way, and then we're gonna talk about it by reducing body fat another way in just a minute. So the ways to add monounsaturated fatty acids, I would recommend things like avocado oil or just straight up avocados, especially because of the fiber too. I would recommend adding olive oil, particularly with your morning meals. That way you're getting more monounsaturated fatty acids in the morning. Another thing that you can do is add just like 100 milligrams or so of fenugreek extract. Now, fenugreek is starting to show some pretty promising effects as far as modulating inflammation. We're seeing it early in the in vitro stuff, we're seeing it in rodent model research, but we have to be kind of cutting edge. It seems as though it's a supplement that might be just as powerful as curcumin in many, many ways. And it's something that you could just take along with your meals. Okay, now let's weave into the body fat side of things here. There was a study published in the journal Circulation. It looked at subcutaneous adipose tissue, so regular body fat compared to visceral adipose tissue, which is you know, visceral fat, like the pot belly, the fat that's around our organs. They found that both of these types of fat were associated with increased uh, C-reactive protein, increased interleukin-6, increased tumor necrosis factor alpha, increase in adhesion molecules, increase in what's called MCT1. Bottom line, huge correlation with inflammation, like tremendous, like even more strong than high glucose. But what's wild is when researchers actually back the data out, and they adjusted for confounders, and they adjusted for BMI as well as waist to hip ratio. What they ultimately found was that only the visceral adipose tissue seemed to be the problem. I mean, don't get me wrong, the subcutaneous adipose tissue was bad, but it was only the visceral adipose tissue that was strongly associated with most markers. What does this tell us? It tells us that yes, we need to reduce body fat, but more importantly, we need to reduce our visceral fat. Our visceral fat is what is causing the inflammation. Our visceral fat is what is potentially causing inflammation that's actually impacting our glucose as well. So what are some things that you can do to reduce your visceral fat? Number one, reduce any kind of trans fats. Okay, no trans fats, no hydrogenated oils, okay? No margarine, nothing like that. If it says partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated, throw it in the trash, do not consume it. Reduce your intake of high fructose corn syrup. Reduce your overall intake of fructose if it's coming from forms that aren't straight up fruit. If you're just guzzling sodas or guzzling Gatorade that has fructose in it, you're probably taking in too much fructose. We can only handle so much fructose at one time before it starts depositing as fat around the liver or visceral adipose tissue. The problem is, is people demonize fruit because of that. It's quite hard to overeat fruit. So I'm not gonna tell you not to eat fruit. I am gonna say avoid high amounts of processed fructose. It's definitely not good. Another thing you wanna consider doing is occasionally fasting. You don't have to totally take on an intermittent fasting lifestyle, but the research is pretty clear that when you abstain from food for longer periods of time, you can tap into that visceral adipose tissue quite a bit. So it's not all about what you're gonna see on the scale. If you step on that scale and you lost 10 pounds, but you don't look like you've lost a ton of belly fat, but you were to go get a DEXA and you lost 10 pounds of visceral fat, you'd be 100 times better off than the person that lost 10 pounds that they could see, but didn't change their visceral fat. So my point in saying this is that if you're making the lifestyle changes and the dietary changes, you can control that visceral fat level quite a bit better. So don't always put the cart before the horse. You can focus on your body fat first and your blood sugar will follow and consequently your inflammatory levels will go down. At the end of the day, body fat is a bigger problem for inflammation than glucose levels are. If you are a healthy person that has stable glucose levels but you are overweight, I do not recommend that you be overly concerned with glucose. I recommend you lose the weight first and let the rest follow. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.